comes about 60% of our replacement needs uh, when, our, when officers call in uh, for our time off or the route engine. Uh, and that's even less now. It's probably around 55% because we've actually rolled back uh, because of, 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 our, of other issues associated with, with that number. So uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's the price of doing business, uh, but it, it, it's, a not, it's not an excessively high amount when you consider the fact uh, that it's very labor intensive, uh, the, the job of being a police officer. And the fact that we're in operation seven days a week and 24 hours per day. Question two. This kind of ties into the whole thing with the library consortium, but it may be um, thinkable the police as well. If we eliminate these two positions, will we lose any reciprocity we have with other towns? Like Officer Nolan mentioned that they helped Reading out when there was 14 break-ins. Will, will that have any, elimination of these two positions, will that have any deleterious effect on our reciprocity with other towns? shifts when there were more than three officers on the street at time for a number of hours. Is that still the case and is that a place where efficiencies could be instituted? If you could address that briefly. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nancy. Um, we currently, uh, through uh, collective bargaining, uh, our officers work uh, four 10-hour days. And because of the 10-hour a a day, it creates an overlap. And uh, that, that's important in public safety. Uh, and particularly, uh, I can speak specifically to law enforcement. Uh, I, can, I can't give you a reason why, uh, but I know that if a change of shifts, stuff happens. And, and I think what it is is people, when they're, they're, they're planning the crime or, or, or uh, whatever, they, they're going to do it. When police officers are back at the station and they're transitioning from one shift to another. Uh, this overlap uh, that Mrs. Bailey was talking about allows us to keep a shift on the road as the oncoming shift is coming to, coming to duty, and they gear up. They have to go through a formal roll call. Uh, you've probably seen an article in the transcript last week about how, how that formal roll call works. Where they share information, they review uh, open cases uh, in the community, 
and prepare themselves to get on the street. So that, that overlap is critical. Uh, and uh, our shifts run, uh, the, the uh, day shift runs from 6 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Our afternoon shift starts at 3 o'clock and they get out at 1 o'clock in the morning. And our uh, late evening shift starts at 9 o'clock and gets off at 7 in the morning. So there is one period of time uh, during the daytime, uh, during that from 9 o'clock at night until 1 o'clock in the morning, when we have uh, about six patrol officers and two sergeants uh, working during that time frame. But coincidentally, uh, that's the busiest time for a police about. Uh, that's when uh, most of, we see most of our domestic violence and crimes of violence occurring uh, during that time frame. So intentionally, uh, we'll overlap during there. To change that, first of all, we require impact bargaining uh, with the representative of two police unions. So, so it, it's not a simple task to change things that, 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 are, that are contractually won by, by the, uh, the two locals representing the police. Uh, would it be more efficient to go back to the old way that we operate? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, you, you know, it will leave us vulnerable uh, during those changes of shifts. It will defeat the whole purpose of, of the uh, stacking our manpower uh, during the busiest uh, time frames when crime occurs. Uh, Maybe she didn't have a hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> Deanna. Is Mr. Nalal all set? What? Question. Did you have a question? I'm not from Mr. Nalal. Oh. There's a question. Back here. Okay. Jack Vick, 36 Lindor Road. I'm just wondering if um, we've approached this the wrong way. Last year we went to the schools and their experts in education and we asked them how to make cuts as best they could. And tonight, we've heard a lot of experts in their departments defend their departments. But we haven't asked them to come here and say, where can you make the cut? You're the expert in your department, where can you make the cut? So they said they didn't have a lot of time to prepare for this meeting. Maybe they need to go back to their department and say, my department's prepared to do this. Because last year, the schools did that. So this year, my department's going to do this. And I think a lot of us here would like to hear that tonight. We've had a lot of defense, but we haven't had a lot of offers of help. declining 
revenue dollars, and that's why we sit here today. No surprises. The, the school's quiet crisis has become a very visible crisis for every parent and every student in this community. We had 10 positions eliminated last year. That number doesn't even add up to 10. There were eight positions that were not hired. That's 18 positions. So I know that the numbers in front of you are very difficult, but let's remember the realities of what's already happened on the school department side. Those cuts, the drastic cuts to personnel and programs, are in addition to driving up the class sizes, which impacts the quality of our children's education, and ultimately is deteriorating the performance scores of our children. I would argue, as someone pointed out so brilliantly the other night, that some of the departments that we put the cuts in, you know, our art departments that only had three to four people, music departments only had three to four people, technology departments only had three to four people, but we were perfectly willing to eliminate those positions and if you want to use the word decimate or eliminate services, we did that across the board in every department of the school department. As leaders of this community, we will ask you on behalf of North Reading United for Education and Stanford Children to reverse this trend and to make the necessary and difficult decisions that repairs the damage that was done to the children of this community by disproportionately impacting the children with the cuts that were made over the last two years. Every cut that has been made in the school department has cut to the core. We're not asking for extras. Let's remember that we are 13th from the bottom of the state in per pupil spending. We are 15% below our peer group in our benchmarking analysis. We spend $9,000 per student. Our average peer group community is $10,250. And we are well below the state average of $11,788. Every cut we make, or every position not added back, cuts to the very core of education. And as parents and members of Stanford Children and North Reading United for Education, we've never come before you and asked you to make a difficult choice or sacrifice without being there in the ready to serve this community and ask for assistance in every way we know how. We have asked our legislators for help for several years. We have written hundreds and hundreds of letters to our state representative, to our state senator, to Deval Patrick, to the chairpersons of the House and Senate chair, uh, uh, committees on uh, ways and means. We've got a meeting set up with Brad Jones and Senator Tarr at the end of March to ask for more local aid support and resolutions. And we're going to march on April 15th at Beacon Hill with thousands of other members of the state and the Commonwealth to ask for more additional aid. So we've never come before you and asked for your, you know, for any difficult choices to be made without being willing to roll up our sleeves and do the work for you to find the solutions. So I hope that you will remember that. So what I've learned from Stanford Children is to be very direct and to be very specific with our ask. So my very specific ask is please provide a non-override budget that supports and restores the people and the programs that were cut last year and begins to restore the quality in the North Reading Public School System. If we don't make these difficult choices, and I know they're all very difficult as, as citizens and as employees of this community, we fail as parents. We fail as leaders, and we fail as a community. <clears throat> By investing in education, we give our children the building blocks to help them be successful citizens of the future. We preserve the value of our homes, and we help restore the pride in our community. We are all very grateful to all the town employees and the public servants in this room and that are home watching. We're grateful for the work that you do every single day. Um, we look forward to more work to help resolve and work towards solutions. But I'm also looking forward tonight to hear how you plan to solve this very growing invisible crisis.